Hello everyone. Once again, uh, I want to start to thank everyone for being on the side of the screen. It means a lot. I know that we've been living really difficult times and we are on a Sunday, so a special thank you to everyone that uh, decided to log in and uh, to tune in on this multi-platform talk, so thank you. I also want to thank the organization uh, for putting these events together. Uh, there's going to be a really cool thing at the end of the Duck Death Fest, uh, the World Adventure. Stay there. Uh, I'm going to be there just to try to talk with uh, some of you. So there are a lot of really cool things that the, they've organized. So before I start, let me just uh, give a big round of applause to everyone. It's not, <laughs> it's not awkward at all to clap on an empty room, but let's move on. So, uh, as we are saying, uh, you can find me on Twitter at CFOSMOTA. I usually tweet about Android, about Kotlin, about photography. I'm currently Android GDE. I've been working with uh, Android for the past 10 years now. So, I'm becoming quite old. And for the last two, I've been playing with Kotlin Multiplatform. As I was mentioning first on side projects, and hopefully next month I'm going to start full-time working on a multi-platform project on my day job. I'm also the founder of GDG Quim and co-founder of Cotty Nights. I've been writing at Hey Wonder League and Opinions Online. And I have this big dream of one day having my own podcast or co-hosting a podcast. So if there is anyone with the same uh, with the same goal that's currently listening, so feel free to DM me at the end to ping me to talk with me. I love travel, photography and running, and lately, of course, just the last two. I've built a couple of materials for this talk. You can find the slides at my speaker deck, the code for the application that I've built on my GitHub, and they also written a code lab that you can use to follow to create your project on multi-platform. Uh, it also has a last section where I explain you how you can move code from an existing project to multi-platform. I'm going to tweet all of these links at the end, so uh, you don't need to write them up. You can just uh, go there and click on the on the link. So let's start. I really like this image because I think it uh, it works really really well on what I'm about to to explain. Since almost 2006, we've been seeing a lot of solutions for developing for mobile. Of course, we have native. And with native, we can build this amazing castle on the left. We can do it using Android or using uh, using Java or using Kotlin for Android. You can do it using Swift or Objective C for iOS. Although before we reach that castle, uh, we have a long path ahead. And if you're maintaining both applications, well, it's going to take you some time uh, to really achieve that big castle at the end. On the other hand, we have a lot of uh, cross-platform, hybrid platform, web-based platform solutions that will allow you to share one code base across both platforms. And it's true that uh, you can develop an application faster, but it's going to be more difficult to maintain, to implement new features. And well, currently in Portugal, it's raining, so I wouldn't want to be in a house that has the roof falling. And you're going to see why I'm, I'm saying this in, a, in two slides. So I was saying uh, this started in 2006 with PhoneGap. Then we started to have a lot of solutions uh, for the past years. We have Shimmering, Emotion, Ionic, React Native, Native Script, Kotlin Multi Platform. And I'm saying here between codes because it's not really a cross platform solution. And most recently, that's gaining quite uh, adoption, Flutter. Of course, that all of these frameworks have their own advantages. Uh, for instance, if your if your team it's it's web based, there are people from web. There is a really small learning curve for web developers, mostly because some of these languages are already familiar to web developers. You're going to have uh, basically one. Um, we're going to share the code between both platforms. So typically, you don't need a big team or two teams to develop your application. Although I always advise you to have at least one person from Android, another person from iOS, just to give you more that UI UX input or, try, or, or explain which features you can get from the platform. 
So this is going to also mean that you're going to have less time in working hours to build, to test, and of course to fix issues because you're going to share the same code base. Unfortunately, if you're going to have framework specific issues that happen, this might not be entirely true, but uh, typically let's hope that you're not, you're not going to have that much issues. Of course, this also brings you a lot of disadvantages. For instance, one of the worst for me, and this happened to me a couple of years ago, is that you're chained to the framework implementation of the UI. For instance, if you're doing things natively, your UI will update depending on the OS that you're running. If you're using one of these platforms, you're going to develop them on widgets, and widgets require that you recompile the app for new updates. For instance, a couple of years ago, there was a huge redesign on iOS, and I had a, an application built with Xamarin for, for iOS, for iOS and for Android, of course. Uh, in iOS, typically, uh, at the time, 80%, 80% of its users update to the new OS for the next two to three days. My application uh, was, when those people updated, my application was still looking old. All the other applications on the device were having that clean and uh, modern UI. Mine, since uh, it was built with Xamarin and I was using widgets and not native components, had the same old look that the other application that it had on the previous OS. I needed to wait like five to six months for Shemarin to launch an update. I then updated my Shemarin code, re rebuilt the app, launched it to the App Store. The users, uh, the App Store needed to approve it. The users installed it. And uh, after a while, I think it was like seven months, I lost a lot of users, basically because I was having an old look and there were a lot of more applications that had that clean look uh, that I didn't. Well, while I, while I was creating this talk, I noticed, I have here a small example, let's see. This is uh, trying to connect uh, with Facebook from Instagram. Let's just pay attention here to the, to, the, um, to the dialogue in the spinner. This one, are you seeing this? This is like Android 2.3. <laughs> Someone on uh, Facebook or on Instagram forgot to update that component. This is a really problem of, the, of not doing things natively. If your operating system is a recent one, you're going, to see, you're going to see things like they were a lot of time ago. And the same thing happens. If you have an older device and you're trying to run your application, it won't also be consistent because it is going to have that new feeling that none of your applications have. Also, of course, performance is not the same. You've got a layer in between. Sometimes if one of, the, one of the operating systems, if Android doesn't have a specific feature, typically the framework won't support it, even if iOS supports it. So sometimes you end up run, writing native code. Well, Dart is not a widely used language, at least for now, uh, if you compare it with Kotlin, and you're committed to one framework and one language. All of this that I'm saying depends on projects. Uh, depending on what you're doing. For instance, this last point, let's imagine that you're doing a project that's for the next five to 10 years. Do you really want to commit your project to a framework that you have no certain certainty that's going to exist after five years? What will happen at that time? Are you going to develop the project and the framework? <laughs> Are you going to, to re rewrite your project on a different framework natively? So all of these are things that you need to think before selecting one of these solutions. So what about cross multi-platform? I mentioned between codes, that's not really a cross-platform solution. And this is because uh, the goal of multi-platform, of Kotlin multi-platform, KMP, is that you're going to share the application logic. It's not intended to share all the UI, you're just going to share the application logic. So you're going to have your business logic, all network requests, parsers, database, and then you're going to have your two applications, one for Android and one for iOS, all of them developed natively. Being said, there are a lot of projects that are already using Flutter, for instance, with multi-platform, and they're working relatively well. So multi-platform gives you the chance to select what you want to do while sharing all of this business logic. So if, if we look at the disadvantages that I've mentioned before, 
well, almost none apply. So the UI is developed natively, so you don't need for the iOS to update. You don't need to rebuild your application. Everything will work outside of the box. So performance is going to be the same. You're going to have more compilation time, uh, especially for iOS and JetBrains already has this on their roadmap to improve. So you might see some uh, increase. We're going to see some increase on compilation time, but in runtime it's going to be pretty similar. Well, you're going to write native code, yeah, the UI. So you're no longer dependent. Kotlin is one of the most training languages nowadays. So it has an amazing community support. The Slack uh, for Kotlin Slack, it's really, really good. So you've got that for you. So I was saying, you've got all the language features that Kotlin, give, Kotlin gives you. They are continuously updating um, everything. So this is really, really cool. It has really, really low risk because you decide what you want to share. For instance, let's imagine that you just want to share your unit tests. You can do this. If you want to share just your uh, network requests, you can also do this. You can decide what you want to share. You should start small by sharing one part. And uh, as soon as the team feels that multi-platform is the way, you can just keep pushing new and new things. It's interoperable. You've got consistency across all platforms, meaning that, um, well, uh, <laughs> if you put a bug on the, on the stack, you're going to share it across all platforms. But if you see the cap is half full, if you fix a bug, you're going to fix this bug on all the platforms. So that's great. There is a really strong investment from JetBrains and the community. There are a lot of people already playing with Kotlin multi-platform. Although it's still on alpha, we're seeing that we already have a couple of applications on the store and many more to come. Um, we've got space that is full Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, this slide was presented on uh, now two years ago on the Kotlin Conf. They, sh they show that Cash App, for instance, shares their business logic, Yandex Map shares the business logic and wrappers for C++ libraries. Plan Green also shares their sync logic, management of offline data, etc. So each one of these applications decided to share what it made sense for them. I also want to add that uh, I think almost bi-weekly, uh, sorry, uh, weekly, there is a, a new blog post that uh, JetBrains published about companies moving to multi-platform. For instance, there is a really good one that Netflix shared where they start moving their application to multi-platform and they're seeing a lot of good results. So apart from being on alpha, there are a lot of people already adding this way. Of course, once again, it's not intended to share everything from one day to the other, but starting small and see their use case and what makes sense for them. So what's Kotlin multi-platform is when you're using Kotlin projects that target more than one platform. Easy. So imagine that you have three platforms that you want to support. And remember that this is a triathlon. So you've got Android, iOS, and the web. You start by creating your presentation layer, model, parser, network, and then you're going to build your view. And then you're going to do the exact same thing for all the other platforms. And the big difference here, apart from libraries that you use on Android, that is, for instance, Retrofit for network requests and iOS, you're going to use Alamofire, for instance. The big difference here is that on the UI itself, so the views are going to be written on, on uh, Kotlin, are going to inter be interacting in some specific way. And on the web, you're going to interact with these views differently. You're not going to use, or typically don't use your finger, just going to use your mouse. So what we want to do is to share all this business logic and implement things natively. So we're going to share all of the network requests, the parser model and presentation layers, and then you're going to implement things uh, natively uh, the best way possible. So this is really great, right? So I've been talking about multi-platform and uh, I believe that everyone now wants to start. So how can you start to develop your application on multi-platform? It's really easy. 
You can start by opening your Android Studio. You now have support on Android Studio for multi-platform. You go to Preference, Plugins, Marketplace, and just write KMM on, or Kotlin Multi-Platform. You're going to see this new plugin. You just click on Install, Restart Android Studio, and voila, you already have multi-platform. You can now go to File New, KMM Project, and it'll automatically create a project. And of course, if you hit Run, you're able to compile it for Android and for iOS. If you're also going to compile for iOS, uh, you need to also have Xcode installed. Okay, although you can compile for iOS from Android Studio, it requires to have Xcode. So I've been talking about multi-platform, but there are things that depend a lot on the platform at hand. For instance, um, on Android, you use shared preference to store uh, something on a preference. Uh, on iOS, we're going to use NES user defaults. So there are different approaches on how, on how we can interact with the platform itself. So how can we, how can different platforms expect to communicate? And I'm really giving a emphasis on the word expect because this is how it works. You def if something is going to be platform specific, you're going to use the keyword expect. So you're going to have your common model, the model that you're going to share and that contains all the business logic. And if something is going to be defined by the platform, you use the keyword expect on that common model. And on each platform, you're going to use the keyword actual to say what, well, is expected. <laughs> but let's see an example. Let's pick a really simple example uh, to know in which platform you're running your application. If you're running on Android, I want to see a low uh, pixel phone. If I'm running on iOS, a low iOS simulator because I don't have an iPhone. And if I'm running on the web, I want to see the, the browser's name. So I mentioned that you're going to use the keyword expect. So basically, you're going to use expect something. And if you look at the path, you're going to see that I'm on shared. This is my shared model. And I'm going on uh, the folder called common main. This common main contains all the shared codes. Okay. So if you have something that's expect, it should be here. If you have network requests, it should be here. You are also going to have Android main, iOS main, GS main. This code on all of these uh, folders, it's going to be platform specific. So we first say that we want someone that's going to define what name is. If you're targeting Android, iOS, and web, you're going to see an error message on Android Studio saying that you're not defining what, what the name really is. So if you press Alt-Enter, it will automatically create all the files that you need. And you just need to say that, uh, in this case, on Android, I'm going to say that name is going to be manufacturer. So I'm going to access, access the Android SDK and saying that name for Android, it's going to be Android OS build manufacturer. If you look once again to the path, I'm no longer on common main and I'm on Android main. So all the platform specific code is defined on this um, Android main, iOS main, GS main. If we now go to iOS, we're going to go to iOS main. And in this case, I'm going to access UI device, to get the current device name. And if I'm going to also target the web, I'm going to GS main and I'm going to use window navigator user agent. And now if I'm running this application on all of these platforms, I've got a low pixel Excel, iOS simulator, and Google Chrome. Easy, right? But let's look a bit closer to this structure. So I'm saying that we're going to have this shard. This shard contains all your business logic, OK? And you're going to have Android app, iOS app, and web. Android app, iOS app, and web contains your UI. It's going to be the same thing that you're already familiar with Android. So you're going to have your source, main, Java package name, and your activities, your resources, your everything that you're already familiar with Android. And you basically just going to import uh, your shared model to have access to your business logic. The same thing happens on iOS. You're going to import your shared model, but as a framework in order to have access to, to all of its logic. Now that uh, if you move to shared, you're going to see, for instance, common main. It's well, all, where all the code 
that your business logic is defined. And if you're targeting Android, for instance, you're going to have an Android main. I'm also adding here, of course, tests because it's you need to it's you don't need to, but it's advised to make tests, especially that you're targeting a lot of platforms. And of course, if you're targeting iOS and GS, you're going to have this also this more of these four folders that contain your platform specific code. But let's see uh, how everything gets together. For instance, when you create a project, all the structure is already created. If you look at your Gradle file, you're going to see that you're going to use the multi-platform plugin, for instance. Uh, you've got this Kotlin uh, section with all the source sets. For instance, you've got here the common main. This common main, it's similar to what we have on Android. Uh, basically, it's where you define all the dependencies. In this case, I'm using Ktor, Kotlin Routines, Serialization, the SQL Delight, multi-platform settings. And in order to have Android support, I just need to say on top that I'm going to use Android. And then I'm going to say which dependencies my Android code needs. So this is easy. If I'm going to run on iOS, I just need to define iOS. I have the chance to use Cocoa Pods here. I, I give you an advice here. For instance, when you use iOS, if you just use iOS instead of seeing if you should compile for ARM64 or x64, it will be slower because you're always going to generate all the frameworks, which typically doesn't happen because you're compiling and testing on a, uh, on a single device and not on all the devices. So for debug purposes, I suggest you to, to check if you're running on a, a real iPhone or on a simulator just to compile for that architecture. Uh, once again, all the dependencies you add here to dependencies. If you're targeting the GS, you just need to import GS and once again, all the implementations that you need. So basically, if we now hit compile and target all of these platforms, you've got uh, these beautiful diagrams. So we've got your common code with expect and then on each of the platforms, you've got actual and the code that you can use and it's generated. So, Everything, I believe it's are fully enthusiastic. I can't see you right now, but I'm really trusting on you. So it's time to show you a project that I've made. I've made a really simple project. Basically, I have a lot of conference on my GIST, on my GitHub, and I'm go just going to make a request for this information. All of this business mo uh, logic is built, and I only needed to implement it, the UI on each one of these platforms. I know that, well, I'm not a web developer, so this is not the best <laughs> web experience. So feel free if anyone wants to make a pull request with a better uh, screen, feel free. I will update my slides afterwards uh, and I will gladly accept it. About the project, it's really, really simple. Uh, I've got a recycler view on Android. I've got a white table view controller on iOS. On the web, I know there is a lot of frameworks. I don't even go there. Uh, you've got your network requests. You parse these responses. You start them locally, and then you're going to use the system preference to save a user preference if you're going to show all the online conferences or not. Typically, if we're going to do this natively, we're going to use all of these libraries. So if you're on Android, typically use Room. On iOS, you use Cordata, uh, you use Retrofit for network, Alamo Fire, Gaze, and just serialization. Rx Java, Rx Swift. <coughs> Sorry. And of course, if you're using the web, well, there are a lot of frameworks that you can use differently. Uh, you can use Redux, Fetches, and API Serializer, etc. I don't even go there. But the only thing that's going to be different is the UI itself. So we can just merge everything, all of this business logic, and instead of using for database room on one side and core data on the other side, we're going to use SQL Delight. For net re network requests, we're going to use Ktor. For uh, serialization, we're going to use Kotlin X serialization. I'm going to use MVP here, although you can use MVVM, for instance. My only approach with MVP is that it's, well, at least I find it easier to convince iOS developers to go with an architecture that they are already familiar with. I'm going to use also Kotlin Next routines and Kotlin tests for the tests. And then I'm going to develop everything natively. 
So if you look at uh, an eye level diagram of our code, it's going to be something similar to this. I'm going to use Ktor, Kotlin Exterilization, SQL Delight, and then I'm going to use the get conferences to access uh, and make the request. And then the setting SQL driver and dispatcher are going to be my platform specific code that I need to write on Android main, iOS main, and GS main. So how can I make this? Just a few slides uh, with code. Really simple. Uh, Let's start by creating a conference API. Okay, we're already familiar with this structure similar to Retrofit. We have this REST API, so in this case, I called it the conference API. I'm creating an HTTP client, and I'm just going to met, make a uh, get to a specific URL. Typically, uh, I'm using string here because the GitHub gists it's going to, to retrieve the content type as text plain instead of JSON. Uh, if you're already returning with JSON, you could just decode uh, your response here instead of going to parse it afterwards. So instead of, of uh, making get string, you, you should do something like list of conferences. So I've got my conference class here. All the fields correspond to the JSON response to these values. And then I'm just going to call my conference API that I've received. I'm going to call the fetch confs. Once I have this result, I'm going to decode it from string. Once again, I'm doing this here because the content type is text. Otherwise, this line wouldn't be needed. And uh, if everything works as expected, I'm just going to call unsuccess uh, with this list of conferences. So this unsuccess on failure, we're going to see in a few slides. Basically, I'm going to use them to say if everything worked as expected or not. If you go over to the presentation layer, we're going to have this conference list presenter, and I'm starting by creating an iConference data. Okay, this is going to be an interface that the UI is going to to set, and it's going to be used to be to notify the UI when the information is available. So it's going to be really really simple. Uh, it has two methods, two, two functions: on conference data fetch and on conference data failed. And those are going to be called when I'm going to call the conferences, the get conferences class that I've shown you before. So that on success, it's going to be mapped on on conference data fetch, and on failure is going to be mapped on on conference data failed. Of course, we could do everything on that class. I do it here. So if, for instance, I don't need to update anything, basically I didn't need to, to notify the, the UI. In order for the UI to, to access all of this code, I created a service locator, basically to initiate the variables and, uh, or in this case, the classes, and I don't need to be always creating new and new classes. Basically, you create a conference list presenter with a get conference that's going to use the conference API. And uh, this co get conference presenter, it's going to be called when we reach the UI level by calling by initializing this presenter with service locator get conference presenter. Once you're at the UI level, you call the attach view that's going to trigger the request to the network. And once this information is available, you have on conference data fetched and you update your recycler view, your UI. Since you're doing things on the UI level, you can still use all the libraries that you are already familiar with. You can use uh, glide for the images, you can use everything that you're already familiar with Android. The same thing is applied to iOS and the web. Once again, it's important to mention that multi-platform multi -platform projects are still on alpha. So you might find a couple of issues. Typically, when trying to have, when you're targeting a lot of platforms and make some updates on once on uh, a library that you're using, some of them might uh, trigger some errors on another platform. Typically, this happens, at least on my experience, when you're doing uh, mobile and web, and you update something on mobile, typically break something on web, uh, and it will take you a couple more time than it would be expected to resolve these compilation issues. Uh, a really good advice here, at least in my opinion, is start small. Don't try to reach 100% of shared logic. It's the same approach when you started developing with Kotlin. Uh, start by 
making small models, start by going with unit tests, and then as things are you get familiar with, start by sharing your network, database, uh, uh, image processing library that you have, start doing small things and see how your team and how your project reflects. How to evangelize the iOS team? Um, my approach at the time was showing them, okay, you can have this already done for you, you just need to implement the UI, and they were really keen on it. You can also use the argument that if you don't uh, if you don't like this approach, you can go to other cross-platform solution and you won't develop on Swift. And you can follow a third approach that it's it was suggested by Kevin from TouchLab that it's show the the pains that iOS development has, for instance, the core data, and say that on multi-platform you have SQL Delight, it's way easier to use. Some uh, conclusions here. You've got a really good, strong community support. A lot of people are already using Kotlin nowadays. Google and JetBrains are really pushing forward Kotlin. So you've got all the language adventures. It's two times faster to write the business logic because you're going to share it. You're going to be write it. To, it's going to be faster also to write unit tests because you're going to write them once. And a really important thing here, it's going to, it's, you're going to have consistency. You're going to have one tech stack. So this is really important to have the same consistency on all the applications. And this happens a couple of times, uh, or more times than I want to admit, that the Android team decided to implement a cache mechanism on we're making network requests, but iOS application, the iOS developers didn't implement it. So you don't have consistency across uh, both platforms, and you only notice this when you're already on production. So here, you have consistency across all the platforms, which is great. I have a couple of libraries that I'm using and all the direct links, a couple more projects. Uh, these are on my slides. You can just copy them here and uh, open them on GitHub, for instance. I've built a code lab for this. Uh, you can access it on the GitHub IO KMP code labs, how to create a multi-platform project and how to migrate. I've got here a couple more of links uh, that you can use to learn more about multi-platform. And what's next? Well, you already start to have Compose for desktop, so you can even go further and reuse your Compose code. There are a lot of, uh, of uh, side projects that are already using this. They're really, really cool. And uh, this was a bit teased on Twitter by Bashrov. That's Compose for the web, so you can go even further and use Compose for the web. Probably not this year, but... Uh, probably next year or the year after. All of these links, you can find them once again on my speaker deck, on my GitHub, uh, and I'm going to tweet all of them at the end of my talk at my Twitter, at C. Afonso Mata. So, I think it's time for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Carlos. It was a very interesting talk, and I really like how how powerful it is, and how um, yeah how easy it makes it to integrate different things. But most of all, what I like most is uh, how organic you can grow it. That you don't have to to go all in and take a big technical risk, and then uh, figure out that it might not work for your team, but the, that you can just do it like bit by bit. And it's also from uh, what you suggested. Uh, is a good approach anyways. Yeah, I, I started by doing that because of course in the in the when we start and start to read a lot of things about multi-platform and it was the same thing as Kotlin. We always want to go 100 percent and uh, go dive in. Of course, I never advise you to do that. Uh, try to fight your instincts instincts, but it's always good that you can start small and see if it makes sense for you. And then bit by bit start implementing the start by implementing more and more features on multi-platform. Cool. Well, uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. So please, as I already said in the, in the comment, um, put down your questions. We have time to address them. I'm sure there's, um, there's a lot of stuff that you're more interested to know. And Carlos really seems to know like really very well how everything works. So please feel free to with some comments. Okay, so while, uh, while people are typing, 
I'm going to ask you a question myself. Okay. Uh, to me, you made, made it sound so awesome that there's like barely any downside and it's like there's still a bullet that solves all the problems. But we all know <laughs> that uh, there have been plenty of problems like that. And we've seen like mind blowing presentations where we're like, okay, well, I can't see how not everybody adopts this within, I don't know, months or whatever. And then you see a technology failing because um, people get too excited and they don't see the downside. So is there anything that from your perspective you see now where you uh, will say, okay, be worried about that or this is uh, something where there's a, there's a weakness uh, of it or where like it's not suitable for this these kinds of projects? Well, um, of course, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to advocate it. Of course, there are things that uh, there aren't there yet. Uh, for instance, if, if you look at JetBrains roadmap, they have, uh, well, it's uh, a large chunk. It's dedicated to multi-platform. So there are a lot of things that are trying to, to improve. For me, personally, there are the two worst things that I can say. It's having everything working together. For instance, uh, I remember that I've updated the Hector library for network requests and suddenly my OS build broke. And that happens because I was using a Coroutines version that uh, that had an internal conflict with the guitar. So I ended up spending a lot of time trying to understand that problem and now I could overcome that. There is a really cool thing here that is the Slack community. People there are really, really active. Uh, Every time I had a problem, and I had a couple problems on these past years, I basically received a response in two or three hours. Not uh, only from people from the community, but by JetBrains itself. So this shows that they are really trying to push it forward. And uh, yes, you've got a lot of pains nowadays, uh, especially when you're creating your project and you're starting, your project starts to grow in complexity. Nevertheless, if I look backwards to one year ago, I can see how much it evolved. And uh, having this in mind, I believe it's how much more it's going to evolve on the future. And I think now it's the right time where people should start uh, learning how to, to play with multi-platform because they're not as early as I was two years ago where I spent, <laughs> I'm going to say this, but this was two years ago. I remember the first time where I tried to have everything work with Android, iOS and the web. I spent like two weeks, <laughs> two long weeks, just trying to have a network request. Nowadays, you just go file new and create your project and everything is already given to you. So we've come a long way. Of course, at the time, it's, it wasn't even alpha. So, well, this was expected. Um, but this is one of my main main points, uh, my main, main pains, let's say. Another one, uh, and it's way better, uh, we now can debug iOS code. For instance, this was something that two years ago, it wasn't possible. Uh, Test Lab had a, a, a plugin one year ago, and it worked uh, fairly good, but it was something that it was really, really difficult. You needed to just, uh, the, my debug was just entering prints and trying to understand what, why the hell things weren't working. Uh, nowadays, there is also there was also a problem with uh, the coroutines, but uh, I think it was already merged. If not, probably it's going to be on the upcoming weeks, where that iOS still needed uh, to have a specific version for coroutines, and uh, hopefully after this new merge, things uh, are going to be more outside of the box. Yeah, I mean, it really underscores how important it is to have a community and to have support. And especially if you learn something new, if you learn new technology, especially if you learn a new language, it can be so frustrating if you just go, go buck hunting and this just because you don't understand a certain concept uh, well enough or you just don't know what how you need to express it. Um, it's so valuable when you have people who are like, oh, yeah, it's like this. And like within seconds, you can understand it. Yes, uh, I, I remember when I when I, I have another project that I think it's also yeah it's also on my GitHub that it, I was integrating with Firebase, and uh, it's it's where the code lab is based. And I was I wanted to migrate the code from Firebase to to multi platform, and then I noticed that doing that uh, for iOS was really really painful. <laughs> 
because uh, well, the libraries that we had didn't target the last version of Kotlin, and I wanted to have all the latest uh, releases. So basically, I ended up uh, looking out TouchLab, and TouchLab here is a really an excellent company that's really uh, on the next step for for multi platform. Seeing how they implemented uh, their Firebase uh, library. And having to deal with C interops and trying to see how I can move everything to to multi-platform scenario was really, really tricky. But nowadays, uh, as I was saying, uh, a lot of people are already pushing new libraries. So the libraries that at the time you don't have, you now start to have. And uh, every day more you see new and new libraries being launched. Awesome. Yeah. Sounds very exciting. So. Uh... I think like you got me convinced, and I'm sure you got a bunch of other people interested too. So, Great. Um, yeah, check it out, try it out. It seems to migrate really well, or like really, like easily by doing it bit by bit. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I um, I urge you like when you when you like go and uh, have questions that you didn't come up that come up later on, um, please. Email ask this. Oh, okay, here. Sorry, <laughs> ask your speaker at def, Um, Then we'll forward it to Carlos. And yeah, otherwise, if there's a very quick question now by somebody who, who types very fast, then I can put it on. And otherwise, would like to thank you very much for giving us this uh, this, this view, this perspective. Um, have a wonderful rest of the the conference. And thank you. Your Sunday. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And uh, I hope to see everyone also on the World Adventure. Uh, it was really cool. I was playing with it yesterday. So let's see if uh, if we can have a lot of people there. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure having you here. <laughs> thank you.